<sighs> what has it been? Nine weeks? <laughs> That's long enough. No reason to drag this on any further. Finally. No more cigar. have here anyway, against the dark, it's a tale of a small group of survivors in the midst of a spreading infection that causes a flesh-eating vampire outbreak. Wait a minute, vampires? Don't they mean zombies? Not according to the synopsis, which sticks to the word vampire, despite the fact that the creature is described more as a nocturnal zombie. Anyway, Seagal is a swordsman named Tao who happens to be the best in the world. Well, to be fair, I guess there's a chance that he is the only swordsman left in the world. Well, I guess we'll have to... Take a look at Against the Dark and see what the hell it is. The movie opens with the dictionary definition of infection. Because that's such a complicated, rarely used term. Then we get our normal zombie apocalypse opening reel with all the exposition you'd expect. But since no one was immune to the effects of the virus, authorities were ultimately helpless as the infection rapidly spread. A zombie apocalypse and the police do nothing to the people beating on their riot shield? My suspension of disbelief is already broken. In reality, they'll beat your face into the concrete for having the audacity to take their picture. They further reiterate that there was no vaccine and nobody was immune, plus mention the infected take on a nocturnal behavior for no apparent reason. And there exists a group of swordsmen called Hunters, which establishes that Steven Seagal is in the movie. A few shots of the hospital from Kingdom Hospital, and we get right to the action, where Kid evidently didn't pay attention during the opening and decided to take a walk in the middle of the night. Fortunately for him, Seagal shows up, lightly waving his sword around the monsters until they fall over. Let's get this boy out of here, take him to a safe place. We're not here to decide who's right or wrong. We're here to decide who lives and dies. Okay. Most guys would assume child right and monsters wrong, but... Enough of them, though. It's time to meet the real stars of this movie. Amelia, played by Emma Catherwood, Dylan, played by Daniel Percival, and Sky Bennett as Charlotte. So we have a horror movie set in a hospital at night with Sky Bennett in the cast. I'm pretty sure we could get away with calling this movie Dark Floors 2. Oh, but let's not forget the most important character of all, Stephen Hagen playing the lovable stoner. How the hell do you have so much of that left? You'd be surprised what you can find in people's medicine cabinets, if you look hard enough. Lipstick, a bag of weed, spare ounce or two of weapons-grade plutonium. They establish they're just looking for a safe place to sleep before we move over to Dorothy, played by Jenna Harrison, having nightmares about the same oddly edited feasting scene this movie feels is so good it is somehow necessary to use it as a transition through the majority of it. <laughs> And this introduces us to Morgan, played by Danny Midwinter. You know, for a zombie apocalypse, there sure are a lot of assholes kicking around. Things may never be the same again, but it will get better. <laughs> okay. Judging by the acting on display in this little exchange, I wouldn't hold my breath. But maybe things are looking up, and... Jenny is dying, and the food's all gone. Okay. What exactly did you mean by better? Maybe though they won't be so lonely as they instantly run into the other group of miscellaneous assholes and strike up a conversation. We just lost two others to pneumonia. We're here for the medication, that's all. The fuck? She doesn't look sick to me, and before you said you were just looking for a safe place to spend the night. Which shouldn't be a problem, according to Dorothy. It's pretty safe in here. <laughs> Which is exactly why we're filming a horror movie in this hospital. They run into a problem, though, when it turns out that their path is blocked by a small pile of easily movable cabinets. 
Therefore, they must take an alternate route to the pharmacy. But don't worry about that anymore, as they completely forget about the illness and the medication immediately, and instead muse on the need to reach the security doors before the generator dies, trapping them inside. Because they obviously can't just go through that open window once the sun comes up. No, 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 that wouldn't be nearly contrived enough. Watch out, though, as Amelia is wary of unsubstantiated claims. If there was anyone left, they would have come for us already. That's what we keep praying for. No, that's what you keep praying for. What's your faith, Amelia? Hey, I'm a realist. The only one that's going to keep us alive is us. Yeah, she doesn't buy into superstition and actually works towards her goals. And for this crime, she will be killed. Ricky discovers something about their new path, though. Dude, I'm too stoned for this. Jesus. Amelia. What? It's just that Stop it, Dylan. Whether we take the Lord's name in vain doesn't mean a goddamn thing anymore. We get it! She has no faith and will therefore be eaten at some point, and he believes the creator of the universe is his best friend and will protect him. And I guess the writers assumed that I would identify more with him. Kinda fucked up there. They remove the barricade, that doesn't look much harder than those cabinets earlier, and launch on forth towards death in the smell of rotting flesh because, well, you remember what Dorothy said, right? It's pretty safe in here. So safe, the door leads directly into a hallway full of guts and body parts, which brings the group to a room full of dead people hanging upside down with their intestines falling out. It's pretty safe in here. Oh, I, I get it! She's a ditzy blonde character, right? She's just really that stupid, right? Just... shoddy writing? Fuck. They slip by easily enough, so evidently none of the dead there got infected because no zombies. Or emotions, anyway. What is this? Guys, this is terrifying. But I believe we can make it through, alright? Don't cry. <laughs> enough of these guys, we've got to go to Seagal and his group of badasses. Actually, they cut to them quite a few more times in this and cut immediately back. It's like the movie's just trying to remind us that Seagal will show up later. And that time has not yet come, as we instead go to Taggart, played by Tenoi Reed, clearing out an area by himself. So the reason they go around in this group is what? Or does Seagal just send him off on his own so he can spend more time with cleavage and half-cleavage? He kills a guy without even getting a good look at him, and then tries to help the crying woman, again without getting a good look at her. Are you alone? It's like this motherfucker has never played Left 4 Dead before. Because, surprise, she's a zombie. Or a vampire. No, fuck it, she's a witch. And he shows off his skill at taking her out in this completely unnecessary scene, then is back with our pathetic group of survivors. Yay. Then I started to realize that just because they were grown-ups didn't mean that they could protect me from monsters or demons or whatever. They're not monsters or demons. What? The, uh, hey, Dylan, you're supposed to be the man who has faith, so yes, they are demons. They're just diseased. Does anybody have consistent character traits? I don't know for sure that no one can protect me. Hey, come here. We'll protect each other, okay? Don't worry about your mommy and daddy being eaten. Let's sing a song to cheer you up. Actually, is she even upset? With these dry line deliveries, I can't tell. Stoner, on the other hand, interrupts this touching scene by taking a dump and having a chat with Morgan. They cover the basics of bullshit exposition and backstory. You know, some of the wounded were immune and... Wait a minute! Some of the wounded were immune and... But since no one was immune to the effects of the virus. So by no one, they meant some. Fucking brilliant. Never mind that, they move on to explaining the monster for us. And everybody thinks that they're vampires. But they're not. No shit, they're zombies. They're mutants. It's an infection. Presumably an infection of the blood. Mutation doesn't spread that way. But what's the myth based on? Being a slave to blood and flesh. No, no flesh, just blood. Everything you do, everything you think about, is just getting more 
but no mind of your own, no feelings. That's uh, still zombies. Vampires you could hold a conversation with. Thankfully, he has a tech before he can make any more of an ass of himself, and the two of them fight off a zombie granny in a battle so uneventful, they hardly mention it with the rest of the group. Besides, you don't want to spoil everyone's dinner as they stop by the cafeteria to- What the fuck?! You said there was no food left! No food! Don't give me that there wasn't food where you were, but is here. You're still in the same safe building you started in! There was no food left and we were losing power. Open your eyes, man! Food! Food everywhere! Watch your take, Ricky. Dude, I'm too stoned for this. Look out, though, because he's got a paper cut. It's just a little scratch. Relax, it's not like I'm infected or anything. But you're bleeding. Any amount of blood can attract them. Uh, are they sharks now, too? And I wouldn't worry too much. Have you forgotten about that hallway of gore earlier? Might attract them a little more. More useless exposition follows. <laughs> Let's just take a listen for old time's sake. What if we are the only ones left? You know what that means? What? It means where are the monsters now? This world isn't ours anymore. Well, I figured with your vampires that are obviously zombies, this might have been inspired by I Am Legend, but thanks for removing all doubt and spoiling the ending to I Am Legend. Not only that, but this analogy completely fails in this movie, as the fact that there is a large military operation getting ready to carpet bomb the city clearly shows that they are not the only ones left, and would seem to imply this infection didn't spread very far at all. We're gonna sterilize the area. Lieutenant. If any of your hunters are on the ground, if you're here for them, tell them to get out of there. And in case you're wondering, that is Keith David, who you may recognize from you know, a bunch of movies, I guess. Personally, I recognize him as the voice of Julius from Saints Row, but that's just me. Continuing on their way through this jai fucking gantic hospital, they decide to cut through the morgue. Strangely enough, it's full of zombie vampire mutants! Also, Morgan escapes with Dorothy and Charlotte, but barricades the door with the others still inside, guaranteeing that he will certainly be killed off later in the movie. Dylan, on the other hand, begins suffering from automysophobia. I have to wash my hands. If the infection spreads by touch, uh, every last one of you is fucked in a half. So he heads to the bathroom, alone of course, and runs into a weird guy and naturally doesn't scream or call for his friends to show up, allowing this strange figure to do whatever the hell he does while off screen, because by the time his friends check up on him... Oh dude, I am too stoned for this. We do get to see him dragged through the hallway of guts, so if it transmits by touch, he's extra screwed now. Morgan, on the other hand, gets jumped by the zombie vampires, resulting in Dorothy and the kid leaving him to die. But who would happen to show up but our walking deus ex machina for this movie, Steven Seagal? Hey, it's okay. I'm one of the lucky ones. The thing about luck is, you never know what's gonna run out. Am I really going to have to cite that line later in this movie? Come on, he was standing next to Steven Seagal when he said it! Look out, though! Now Dorothy and Kid are separated from the male protector figure, and they get attacked by one of the monsters, thus further splintering the group, as Charlotte runs off during the commotion. After she runs into a few corpses, she happens across a blanket and pillow, so in this open hallway full of dead bodies, it is certainly the safest place in the building to grab some shut-eye. Hmm, the middle-aged office worker zombie. And I'm just curious, this is a hospital, right? I mean, where are the doctor, nurse, patient zombies, security zombies, anything? Strangely, though, he doesn't dive on her and start chewing away like all the others, but instead gets really creepy close. Ew. It's the first time in a long time I've been happy to see Seagal. Back with Amelia and the stoner, they don't run to zombies or any actual problem at all, but this is the point in the script where every group splinters, so she just tells him to stay behind, and he does. Even if you don't like the guy, bring him along. He'll do a fine job of distracting the vampiro zombies while you run away. Or maybe she was just trading him off as Dorothy runs into him almost immediately. Let's go. Man, I am too stoned for this. 
Because after all, she didn't need a stone of distraction anymore, as she happens to run into Zagal as well, not to mention reuniting with a few of the others. Yes, it's a lot of boring character shifting, but it's kind of hard to explain what's going on in the movie if I don't cover this game of musical chairs that the characters are engaged in. Despite everyone else funneling into a single hallway easily enough, Dorothy and Druggy somehow find themselves on a different path, traveling through the hospital's mannequin collection that they had, for some reason. Naturally, this doesn't end very well. Holy shit, that looks real. Man, that is an impressive statue. Well, dude, don't kill me! I am way too stoned for this! After this little snack, we're following these people, but do they really know the way to the security door? I thought you knew the way to the security door. You parked your truck outside it. At least that's what you said 40 minutes ago. Fuckers. Hold on though, we need a new crisis to spice this plot up. Code black. Evacuation mandatory. Emergency backup activated. Why was that helmet there? To have the monitor reflect on it as an alien reference? Really? <laughs> Fucking god. <laughs> Never mind that crime against humanity. Seagal shows up at Dr. Crazy's office to find Dylan is still alive. Mind explaining why he hasn't killed him in the last 15 minutes, although that was clearly his intention the whole time? I mean, that was just the running time of the movie, actually. It, actual story time passing was more like at least an hour. Don't worry, though, Seagal kills off the insane doctor, and Half Cleavage murders his daughter. With all the spiky-toothed zombies running around, I'm starting to wonder if this might have originally been written as Chud 3. As Dorothy is the only character left alone, of course she walks down the creepiest corridor in the hospital. Well, at least he's giving her a fighting chance. And he let her walk past him for about 30 feet before he attacked. She barricades the door, which he could easily just reach in and push out of the way, but then... What's the point of running anymore? We think. We talk. We plan. Alright, sure, okay, fine, whatever. But if you could do that, why the fuck do you do nothing but run around like mindless assholes biting everybody? And wipe your damn mouth! He breaks free and she runs, and of course right into Seagal, so he can show off his badassitude, and the group is splintered no more. Fortunately for Morgan, nobody seems to hold the fact that he ran like hell and locked them all in the room full of zombies against him. You know, just like real life. The Jets take off in preparation for carpet bombing the city, but hold on now, there's still 30 minutes of movie left, so these are the extra slow attack jets, leaving us with plenty of time to see the main group has splintered off from Seagal and the hunters for no apparent reason. And Seagal sent Taggart alone into a large room to fight off the horde of zombies. Again. Is he just trying to get him killed so he doesn't have to share cleavage and half cleavage with him? What the fuck? A tank, man! A tank! You guys seriously have to brush up on your Left 4 Dead skills! I'm starting to think the reason we see Tiger doing all this solo fighting is because this is a later Seagal movie. It's one where the man honestly can't jump around much, and maybe the director realized that your action scenes do require action, so take the good with the bad, I suppose. After this, the group is all back together again. No, they didn't re-meet up after they disbanded earlier. Just go with it. They now face their next challenge. An elevator. This elevator seems to be our only hope. Wait a minute, guys. Let's just think about this. What happens if the power fails? Everyone starts having sex? They find a jump scare, but to make matters worse... Oh. I'm too stoned for this flashback. I don't know why she had that thought. It was Dorothy that saw the man get killed. And even better, Cleavage is killed. And nobody seems to care. After all, the real tragedy is all this elevator footage recycled from Hollow Man. Jeez, if these people had any worse luck, three of them would have been taken out by rogue lightning bolts by now. But by trapped, they mean a short climb down a ladder, which Morgan volunteers for. I'm immune, remember? No, you never brought it up before. And it's not supposed to exist according to the exposition. I don't know how common it really is, but on top of that, nobody seems to care. Of course, this was just a power blip leading to him falling and being attacked by a convenient underwater zombie vamp. Oh, don't worry, he's immune! 
or dead as after the power returns, they leave his ass down there and we never see him again. I don't know what's worse. A bullshit immune character that goes against previously established world details, or the fact that the one guy who might have offered you a chance at making a vaccine is killed while for all intent and purposes off screen, and nobody gives a fuck! Hell, there's more emotion when half cleavage is bitten and has to die. She had no lines. And she didn't have her tits all the way out like cleavage. You didn't care at all when she died. Of course, more zombies attack and everyone splinters. Again. Fuck it, I'm not keeping track of them anymore. You figure it out. Dylan goes towards the light, but it turns out to be nothing but a lamp, and Seagal leaves a couple of zombies to death while the sluggish jets continue their slow progression. Amelia completely lets her guard down at an obvious zombie kid, resulting in her getting bitten. Get her out of here. You're on the fast track to undeath, and you still don't feel it necessary to show any form of strong emotion? But what about the zombie grade schooler? So, so far, two children have been stabbed to death, and both times it has been depicted as a good thing. Yep. Next we see Amelia. However, she's changed. It's not death. I feel more alive now than I ever did. <sighs> no, she hasn't changed at all. She couldn't deliver that line any better than, I've never felt so alive. Dorothy makes it to the door, wasting time trying to pull it up before using that electronic button that was the whole reason they had to hurry the entire movie. And we find out that, no, not a single established plot point in this movie is consistent as these nocturnal vampire zombies have no problem whatsoever rushing towards the open door and bright sunny day. Immediately after the group barely exits the building, we're treated to a stock footage montage of the military bombing the fuck out of the city, easily making their entire plate pointless to the viewer as they clearly were taken out in the subsequent blasts. Sir. Observation teams just reported visual confirmation on the Hunters. Sir, they made it. They're clear. What, did you forget it was Seagal caught in the blast? Of course he survived! Strangely enough, his Seagal powers extended to Dylan, Dorothy, and Charlotte, giving us our happy ending of one small military operation stopping the zombie apocalypse, clearly showing it was never much of a threat to the rest of the world anyway. Oh, I'm sorry, vampire apocalypse. They were vampires, right? You never called them zombies for the whole movie. That was Against the Dark. Unless they change the title halfway through the movie, too! This is the kind of movie you can come into halfway and still understand for the most part because the confusion comes from trying to think of the plot as one whole cohesive story. Several points brought up early on are either changed later or completely ignored. I'm not saying that characters have to remain static throughout the film, but there is a difference between character growth or transformation and just doing whatever the fuck you feel like on a scene-by-scene -scene basis. Not to mention the plot goes wherever the fuck it feels. Hey, there were no people immune to the infection. Oh wait, we mean there were some people. Oh hey, we have someone immune with us. Oh wait, now he's dead. A good story often does have its focus shift a bit during the course of the 90 minutes, but when it's this disjointed, it just makes the entire world fall apart, as there's no reason to even pay attention to the details of how things work. They might be different in five minutes. Seagal doesn't do much for this movie either. In fact, he's hardly even in it. You would think that I'd be happy about that, and in a way I was, but the problem is it would have been incredibly easy to cut Seagal out of the script entirely. Hell, he might have been written into the last minute, I'm not sure. Either way, he devalues the horror substantially, as obviously Seagal will survive a zombie apocalypse in the city being bombed. That's not even a question. Overall, Against the Dark is a woefully shoddy production thrown together however the fuck, with acting so bland, I challenge anyone to seriously become invested in this thing. However, it does manage to find that sweet spot of ridiculousness, being a fine choice to find that bowl of popcorn and circle of friends who can have fun ripping on a bad movie, barely coming in, at two vampiric zombie chud mutant monster men out of five. And where the fuck did it come from? Seriously, who sent this? I... I wonder... Written by Matthew Clickstein, writer of Slimed and 
Oral History of Nickelodeon Golden Age. Hmm. Well, it wasn't creepy. Hmm. Well, thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, try and have an idea of what you want your plot to be before you write your script.